Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar entitled How to Build a Business Case for, you, for HR Tech Investment in Times of Economic Uncertainty. My name is Peter Banks, and I'm the founder and MD of the HR Director. We are a strategic resource for senior HR and people leaders in print, person, and online. Delighted today to partner with Sage, uh, the market leader for integrated accounting, payroll, and payment systems. So let me introduce you a little bit to the to topic today. So Building a business case for investment can be hard and even harder in these times of, un of economic uncertainty. In recent research today by our partner, actually, Sage, 90% uh, of HR leaders revealed that limited budgets are a concern for the future. 82% of the C-suite also said that a lack of these holding HR back from achieving their objectives. So how can HR leaders address this? How can you compete for the all-important slice of pie when companies are managing fixed costs tightly? So in this live webinar, uh, as partnered by Sage, we want to show you how to make the business case for HR tech investment in times of economic uncertainty. By the end of the webinar, we want you to come away with some understanding of the steps you need to take to get that all-important investment and buy-in. Uh, let me introduce you to our, our panel today. Uh, firstly, Daniel Chambers. Daniel, who is the Head of Proposals at Sage. So good morning, Daniel. Hello, good morning, Peter. And also Louise Batia, who is the Head of Delivery at Silver Cloud HR. Welcome, Louise. Good morning. Good morning. So let's just kind of get straight into them, really. So, um, Daniel, if I could come to you today, just give us a little bit more information about you, your role in your organization, so we can all get to know you a little bit more. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, thank so you. Thank you. So, uh, as most people are aware, Sage provides HR and finance software to small and medium sized enterprises. And for those larger organizations who are undergoing um, more formal procurement processes or who have larger budgets, for the spend for the technology. It's really advantageous to have a well-structured proposal put in front of the senior decision makers. And with together with my team and our account executives and solutions consultants, we work really closely with customers to help to build that out and to support with building the business case and being able to convey that through the written form in that all important proposal document. Brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and also, Louise, could same, same for you, please. Just give us a quick bio. That'd be great. Yeah, sure. So I head up the um, delivery function at Silver Cloud. Uh, at Silver Cloud, we support organisations in reviewing their people technology, but we also support uh, businesses in selecting the right people tech um, to take them forwards. Um, and in addition to that, we also help with transformation. So implementing um, solutions end to end, um, managing the change um, and, and in line with what Daniel said as well, also helping organisations to get that business case over the line um, and supporting with the information that needs to go in um, and, and building that case to move forward. Terrific. Thank you, Louise. Um, transformation change, my goodness, two, two kind of keywords there at the moment, isn't there? So let's, um, yeah, let's, let's get underway. Let's run our first poll. Uh, so this will pop up on your screen in a moment and you can then just choose your answer. So, um, so here we go. So what is your top HR slash people management priority for this year? Um, so six answers here. Is it D, E and I? Is it employee health and well-being? Technology review slash investment? Is it talent management? Is it skilling, upskilling? Or is it hybrid, flexible working strategy? In fact, I think we've only got room for five there. I'm so, so you're probably missing one there, the hybrid flexible. But um, have a go at those five, just, just to give us a flavor of kind of who's with us today and what those main kind of um, priorities are this year. Daniel, any, uh, any <laughs> I know which one you want, but any predictions on what will be top? <laughs> Honestly, these are all so big and so important, aren't they? Um, truthfully, I'm expecting to see employee health and well-being as being uh, voted for really highly. Uh, I think organisations are still trying to restore that connection and purpose and, and actually drive performance as their organisations have shifted over the last three years. So I, I think there's a long tail on that one. Yeah, Lu Louise, do you tend to agree or what are you thinking? Absolutely, I completely agree. Um, organisations are investing in their people, health and well-being, um, financial well-being as well, given the current climate. 
Okay, yep, totally right. So let's have a look at the uh, results then. So I can I can see sort of inside in before they put up. But um, <clears throat> so yeah, twenty was well, joint actually twenty nine percent is technology. Uh, there we go, review and investment. 29% talent management, talent comes up time and time again at the moment, 14% employee health and well-being, 14% skilling, upskilling, and then 40% DNA. So fairly split, but those two kind of, you know, jumping above uh, somewhat, um, which is which is probably good from what, what we're talking about today and what we want to see. So that, that's interesting. Okay, great. Um, any thought, any any thoughts on that, you two, if you wanted, anyone wanted to, any concluding points? I think just with that whole organisational change piece around, uh, been the, like I say, the tail end of well-being, uh, the, the talent management is certainly something we're seeing a huge amount as well because the the way that organisations are approaching their individuals and, and trying to understand and drive high performance is is has been transformed. So yeah, really good to see that result. Yeah, Louis. Yeah, obviously following the great presentation, I'm not surprised we're seeing organisations now really investing in the talent that um, that they've attracted and now really want to retain. So not unsurprising at all. Good, good, good. Right. OK, let's get into our first question then. Um, now, listen, a recent survey that actually our partner Sage did today, this, this stat I used at the front end, really, 90% of HR and people leaders said that limited budgets are a concern for the future. So, Daniel, um, if I can come to you, really, I, I'm just um, interested a little bit more. Could you give us a little bit more in, uh, sort of um, information about the survey findings and, and this, this whole point about limited budgets? Because that's a, that's a high percentage. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the timing for this research has been really interesting and, and quite important with uh, coming out of the last three years of what that has presented and coming into the next year of the economic uncertainty that we're observing now. So it's an amazing pulse check on uh, the state of HR and HR leadership. And basically what Sage have done is gone to speak to a thousand HR leaders and C-suite executives to get a 360 view of the role that HR is playing in organisational strategy. Uh, we looked at a thousand cases and we split between about the half of these were up to 250 employee size organisations, the other half were up to about 2000 employee size organisations. So a good spread uh, of, uh, of, of insights there. Um, and just in really trying to explore how the opinions of the C-suite correlated to the opinions of the HR leadership team um, in terms of what the future holds it, it, it presents three important lenses so first of all it looks at where hr is at today like i say that all important taking a breath after the last three years as, we're, as everyone's trying to reorganize and, and, and reposition themselves then hr in the future what are the opinions of where hr leads to in the future and i think this is where the narrative around um, the, the pressure on budgets has really come into play in that research uh, and then finally, the the opportunities that are created by solving those challenges and those gaps and perhaps looking at where opinions differ and providing calls to action, uh, opportunities to uh, change what the future of HR is going to be, leveraging some of those insights. So a, a really important piece of research at a, at a fantastic time. Um, Louise, so, you know, I think... I think I'm interested in terms of you because obviously you're dealing with your clients. Um, so, you know, uh, this is a stat, obviously, uh, percentages, but this is what you're seeing with your your clients. Is this really a case of budgets being slashed, taken away, sidelined? How is this playing out in the real world? Yeah, so we we are completely on the front line with our clients, and I think when we were coming out of COVID, during COVID, we saw organisations needing to react, manage remote workforces almost overnight, um, and you know people professionals having to face into a whole host of challenges in in coping with that. So you know, getting the right technology in place where it wasn't in place, um, you know, the need was recognised, and, and you know, budgets were easy to come by in order to to make that happen, so that organisations could could operate effectively. Um, you know, I think today now we're seeing you know greater economic uncertainty. Organisations still are recognising the the need to invest. That hasn't necessarily gone away. So as you know, HR professionals, we've done a sterling job in establishing the case and the need for that. 
um, and, and the C-suite recognise it. But now more than ever, HR and people systems are competing with other functions and other technology needs within the organisation, which may have equal merits um, in you know, moving that organisation forward in uncertain times. So what we're essentially seeing is uh, the need is, is recognised, but HR, people, systems and technology is just seeing greater scrutiny, additional hurdles in getting that case over the line um, and, and a greater need to really demonstrate and, and put some hard and fast measures against what that return on investment would be for the business. So it's, it's just a, a, it's more of a struggle than it has been um, coming out of COVID, bizarrely. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not it's not surprising, is it? You know, completely. So, and and that whole that so 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 the, that's across the board. You think in terms of your client base, you're kind of seeing that across the board. I guess there's very rare opportunity, you know, where that might not be the case. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, b b organizations are still moving forward with this. There is still a need for systems that's not going away. Um, it would just, as I say, seeing greater scrutiny, a greater need to evidence how that is going to do, you know, impact the bottom line um, and, you know, cr create greater efficiency within business. Um, and as I said, we, you know, people systems are now competing with other uh, IT business solutions that are of equal importance um, that, you know, equally have merit, as I said, um, in, in getting the organisation where they need to be. So, yeah, HR have some competition on their hands. Yeah, and I think that's part of the, the talk today, isn't it? Is that how do you how do you get above that the, the rest of the, the business to get your, your slice of the pie, as it were? But um, so back to you, Louise, again, to looking at, yeah. How do you think HR responding in these times of uncertainty and, you know, and what, what do they need to be able to deliver at, the, at these kind of key times and, and in this near future? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, we've had a particularly turbulent few years. So, you know, coming out of COVID, having to adopt um, flexible and, and full remote working, um, that evolving into hybrid working, facing into the great resignation after that, and, and now obviously into the cost of living crisis and, and the you know, onset of um, concepts such as you know, quiet quitting. So uh, HR professionals have had quite, uh, quite a few years to, to react and, and manage um, and support uh, businesses through that. So you know, now more than ever, um, what we're seeing, and, and as the, the poll results showed, you know, robust well-being and engagement strategies are, are needed to basically foster employee and organisations through those challenges. Um, you know, with our clients, I'm increasingly seeing a spotlight being placed on greater uh, flexible working and how we use technology to to enable that um, and, and to great greater insights um, towards that um, in initiatives such as you know point in time feedback and, and getting that instantaneous um, you know pulse survey results from from our employees um, and as I mentioned earlier as well you know financial well-being and, and supporting employees with flexible play initiatives um, as we are, uh, you know, facing into wage stagnation um, and, you know, gr you know, greater economic uncertainty. So if people technology uh, and effective people technology has just never been more an important enabler to those strategies. Um, and, and, and as I say to my clients, you, you will only achieve that enablement and, and the system will only enable you if you have the data to back you up. So, you know, it, data will help uh, you as a HR function to deliver the right solutions and interventions into your business um, and will provide those hard and fast measures back to the business of how effective they are and, and why they're important and having an impact. Um, and, it, you know, HR has never needed to be more agile and flexible than ever before, really. Um, so it's, it's, it's both an exciting time as a HR professional, but, um, you know, without the right systems in place to support you, um, it is a, a huge challenge to face into. Yeah, I think, you know, as we said, you know, such such difficult times to go through, then we're coming out the other side and, and, and looking at the positives in terms of what we can do and, and the whole world of work. 
let's face it, it's changed. You know, it's been turned on its head. Dan, Dan, Daniel, you know, from your point of view, on your, you know, kind of offering a solution sort of hat on, you know, and, and, and coming up with these um, proposals really in terms of what, what are the key areas within the proposals that you're being asked to offer now or indeed are suggesting, you know, how has that changed? Well, in, interestingly, <clears throat> the, the, the proposals we're being asked for uh, largely remain unchanged. So maybe it's global compliance, uh, mergers and acquisition complexity, uh, retiring platforms or underperforming platforms, consolidation of IT, uh, data-driven insight, like Louise said. And all of these drivers are, <clears throat> and historically have been, quite visible and quite critical and sort of widely known in the organization. So you've got a burning platform, you need something to replace it. Um, in our proposals though, we've always worked with customers to drive hard to step further into what the organizational strategy linkage is and specifically who's driving that strategy and how does your project key into that? What can you deliver back to the business beyond solving the immediate challenge. And with the current uncertainty that we're facing, I think that narrative has only deepened. And what we're really trying hard to work with our customers on is looking beyond the immediate value that the solution brings and trying to engage in a forward view through the next couple of years, based on what we've learned with you know, organizations have had real palpable experience of upheaval in the last few years. What did we learn there? What do we know about the importance of trust and advocacy and resilience in the employee um, across the board with employees and what that does to an organization's bottom line and their ability to innovate and weather the storm? Uh, Louise mentioned the great resignation. I think we saw uh, a few years ago, employees were probably generally quite impressed with the lengths that their employers and HR teams went to in order to reach out and engage and stable the ship when things were looking very, very questionable. I think there was a lot of good faith that came in there, but quickly forgotten um, as sentiment shifted. We're in an interesting position now where, yes, we've got more uncertainty coming down the line. But the way that manifests to the employees is not with a, a necessarily a trusting, strong hand reaching across to them to, to give them stability, but actually they're seeing <clears throat> signals that things aren't quite right. The, the, the free vending machines are starting to disappear and, and costs are being controlled, recruitment freezes. It's palpable, it's, it's, it's visible, and there is a real task for HR leadership and, and executive leadership to try and overcome that sentiment um, and the ability to connect with employees, to be transparent, um, to, to show different ways of investing. I think Louise touched on this just now, different ways that you can invest in employees without spending on more wages, or etc. cetera, are, are really, really important. And that perspective of the strategy and how HR plays a really key and fundamental part in stabilizing the organization going forwards is a narrative that we're working really hard to try to build with the proposals that we're working on. Yeah, I think I talk to an awful lot of people leaders and, and the whole thing, yeah, in terms of salary caps or, or whatever rate they're gonna pay, what percentage they're gonna pay, that's a real issue. So they're constantly looking at different ways they can reward their employees and the track for that traction retention piece. So, you know, it's, get, it's getting a little bit more innovative. And uh, and I like your point about we, we can't look too far forward anymore. You know, those days have gone when people had a five year, 10 year plan. It is, we've shown over the last three years, it can change you know, very, very quickly. So this agility piece is so important. So, okay, let's just, um, any questions, by, you know, any questions you might have about anything we've spoken so far, please do pop them on the Q and A and I will ask them as we go along. So, so please do um, pop those questions in. Let's run our second poll. This again will pop up on your screen. Um, so what is your top challenge for this year? Again, <laughs> might be all of these, but um, so is, is it lack of resources within the HR or people management team, a lack of the right HR technology, not having the right skills in the HR team, amount of work, 
for a lack of analytical skills in, a, in the HR team. So if you can have a, a little go at that one, please, and let us know, that'd be great. Um, Louise, come on then, what's gonna come out top, do you think? So I think lack of the right HR technology, um, potentially, and it, that's not to say that organisations don't have, you know, uh, you know, a core system of records and, and potentially payroll on top of that. But some of the uh, the talent manage management functionality that, that you can see that really accelerates some of the um, it, 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 some of the initiatives that organizations really need to have in place now around well-being um talent acquisition learning upskilling um might be lacking um so so i'm putting my money on that one yeah good and daniel i i, I think those are really really salient points um lack of hr technology i i should imagine that amount of work would probably feature quite highly as well as a as a proxy for as a proxy for everything and the fact that with all this organizational transformation that's going on there's a huge amount of business partnering that's still required to to be done um across the board is coming from quite unexpected places so uh, I, I should imagine that's putting a lot of pressure on hr resource and technology oh you both you both win a prize there very good right so let's look at the answers so so the responses are yeah 64 percent uh a lack of the right hr technology so pretty, pretty clear there. And then 18 percent um, down for the amount of work is, is next and then split 9 percent for lack of analytical skills and 9 percent for not having the right skills in the HR team. Um, lack of resources with the HR team is zero. So that's quite interesting. So, yeah, there's, a, there's this I, again, we're in this time. I'm moving, well, let's move on to our next question, actually, because I think it's pretty pertinent after that poll, because, you know, Daniel, back to you. Let, let's talk tech, you know. It, uh, and it is, I'd say, it's, a huge, it's such a huge enabler over the last three years. We we all know that in terms of remote working and the whole piece. So, so do you feel it's important for employers to embrace new technology uh, and to get ahead of this in this new world of work? You know, it's a very different world we live in now. Yeah, uh, naturally. <clears throat> so, it, it's interesting to think what we mean by new technology as well. So, uh, we're we're seeing technology becoming more and more invisible to those who use it it's it's surfacing at the point of need uh, uh tools and resources and capabilities for for employees and managers so that they can just get work done um i think we we can all we can all remember the times of the the annual employee survey where there was this dastardly questionnaire that everybody had to fill out and cracking of whips to get the data in so that the HR teams could respond. New technology, the way it's being deployed now, it's, it's all about leaving a digital trail for HR to pick up and act on and infer from, whilst at the same time, really helping in a meaningful and material way, uh, employees to, 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 to get work done. So that's the current sort of and and future state of hr technology is as as i see it and yes absolutely that trend forwards is so so vital because it it improves the efficiency it improves the sentiment um there's the old adage that the only time as a payroll administrator an employee is going to talk to you is when something goes wrong you know it's a quite a thankless job so in in the same way the smooth running of an organization is so important uh, you don't necessarily want to be highly visible and in interfering with the flow of an employee's work. You just want to provision the tools and resources for them to to get the work done well. And indeed, those sorts of those sorts of issues like that with pay payroll. You know, that's the things that hurt the most, doesn't it? That's the things that yeah. you know, equally in the blues, going to remember. Um, Louise, so with your clients again, with your client head on, are they looking for better tech solutions? You know, for you know, I guess for the workforce and for the business to to get ahead of the competition. What what's the angles there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as employees in the world of work today, we've come to, you know, expect a level, a consumer grade experience almost when when interacting with systems. And 
um, you know, that there are employees come to the world of work with a baseline expectation of, of uh, what they want to see and, and how they want to interact um, with the people function, their, their management teams, etc. Even more so where we have hybrid and you know fully remote workforces. So it's never been more important. And um, you know, listening to those poll results, I can absolutely correlate and um, and relate to to some of the the challenges if you don't have that people technology and the right technology in place which is the cornerstone to you know supporting and enabling your people strategy then you are wedded down in the transacting and and you are not then innovating and moving the organization forward strategically as a hr professional so you know getting the right tech in place but not only the right tech, but as Daniel said, with you know light to touch and enabling um, business leaders and employees to to get their job done in the most effective way is the most important. It, there is a host of new features out there um, today, which in, in you know not so long ago were were the you know the domain of of dreams, such as chatbots and AI, machine learning. What we're seeing now is uh, smaller um, mid uh, mid-sized vendors really innovating and bringing that technology to life uh, for smaller uh, organ and mid-sized organizations in a really cost effective way so it's an exciting space that technology is getting streets ahead um, the development the innovation that's there is is a really exciting place to be and it all culminates in in getting you know hr professionals where they need to be which is looking at and driving strategy as opposed to transacting and um, you know getting bogged down in, in the day to day, uh, which is equally important as the hygiene factors, but but really technology should be enabling your strategy. So um, it is an exciting place. Um, it, you know, technology is is not going anywhere. Um, it, it's it's going to be as we all know the way forward. Uh, and so building a business case for it and keeping traction to Building out the technology that you've got has never been more important. And that whole, you know, tech is moving so so rapidly, as you say, and kind of we're almost behind the tech, aren't we? And so, but, but you're right. That that admin piece is the piece we need to eradicate. That accuracy, it kind of comes in, and to free up humans to do some more strategic uh, thinking. So, and the team. So, I think it's really, really, as you say, an exciting time, really. Um, so Louise also so let's talk about this this all important slice of pie as we've termed it here because you know how, how really are people people who's going to compete you know within within the boardroom or within the top levels to get that budget that they need to get this tech investment so give us some sort of flavor of um you know especially in times when it's being managed so tightly in terms of the costs you know so give us a flavor yeah absolutely i think daniel touched on it earlier it it has to be rooted in the business strategy more so than ever. I think, you know, in times gone by, HR can go to the board with with a, a strategy in place, and it, it it's it, it's a light nod to the to the organisational strategy. Now, again, it needs to be demonstrating exactly what that return on investment is going to be. And that equally needs to be backed up with uh, with data and evidence uh, on that return in investment. So it always resonates with me. I worked with a, a retail organisation, and um, their uh, their store managers on on the shop floor. You know, they they predominantly had a sales role. They were there to manage their teams, but ultimately they were the organisation's most uh, experienced and, and prolific salespeople at the end of the day. Nevertheless, they were in the back office, hours on end, um, you know, dig, digging deep into rostering, um, doing that manually, managing timesheets um, and not really getting out there and, and doing the role that they were uh, employed to do and supporting the organization's bottom line. Um, when we went in there and, and you know measured the time it took each of those store managers to to get their rotors on a weekly basis uh, in place accurate and published to their workforce it was an inordinate amount of time and actually 
introducing auto rostering and um, uh, and, and getting the data off the back of that. And whilst it took a little bit of time to establish that model uh, and get those measures in place, the return on investment was huge because it meant those managers were out of the back room on the shop floor and, and making a difference as they should be. So it's looking at your organisation, looking at what your business strategy is and what those drivers need to be for the times that we're in, and then really looking at how a HR solution um, can, can drive you forward. You know, similar examples are, you know, organisations who, uh, you know, are in really niche sectors, really needing to attract talents, looking at your time to hire and the overall experience of, of you know, how you both attract uh, and onboard employees. Again, looking at that experience. Um, great technology will enable and attract employees to your business and the faster we get them from from A to B uh, the greater the chance is you're getting the best of the pick of the applicants out there so you can have really tangible measures if you look carefully at what you're trying to achieve as a business and again how that technology can make that a reality for you so data, data, data. Uh, so, you know, if you have to do some time and motion studies along the way, all the better. Um, and, and again, you know, on the other side of things, look at what's the cost of doing nothing to the, for the business. If, if you didn't move forward and invest in your people technology, what ultimately would that mean? How far back would that put you against your competition um, or your challenges that you're facing into? So there's there's lots to look into, um, and but it's absolutely rooted in in your business strategy and the data you can elicit out of that, and and how your tech will move you from A to B. Yeah, I absolutely. And I think sim simplistically, it's kind of work out what you need to do initially to use the tech then in the right the right way. And I think, as you say, it crosses so many different areas which are key at the moment, which have come up on those polls. You know, it's not just one area. So, uh, Daniel, Tim, with your you know your kind of proposal head on then you're going to tell us how best to kind of do this so what what are hrds and cpos need in their arsenal for their battles ahead in the boardroom to get this budget they need well uh, louise just just brilliantly articulated uh, some some really key threads to that uh knowing being able to articulate the cost of doing nothing is an excellent foundation for being able to to describe the real value of what you're proposing because ultimately if if what you hope to achieve is rooted in the organizational strategy then it's technology or resource really is the two options you've got and, and some crafting of roles and real real and that kind of a thing so being able to outline what the cost to achieve what you're trying to achieve would be without any additional investment is a really really important baseline and that sets out the the whole narrative around the roi and the value uh, it's, it's interesting we we learned this a little while ago putting forward business cases that were absolutely uh in, enveloped in value so much value that we've we, we'd observed and had managed to quantify and set out in front of an organization but we'd 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 noticed that actually there was uh, a sense of almost indifference because there was no contrast to that story it was full color no black and white and you really need to give the contrast of this is the situation that we're in now uh this is this is what like louise says the cost of do nothing is and this is the opportunity then that's created off the back of it because uh, as, as humans we just default to understanding things that are in contrast so that's that's a really really important important piece. The uh, the other piece I would like to say is around is, is this narrative around how the strategy of the organisation feeds into what the project is going to uh, deliver in terms of outcomes. It's easier said than done, um, and a great way to tackle that is to look at the stakeholders and and to look at who's who's making the decisions and what's important to them the yeah the the priorities that the decision makers have will really reflect the direction of the organization and knowing that you can service 
what's important to them. Hopefully you're then by proxy able to then service what's important to the organization and have those conversations around how the longer term or medium term strategy is going to be supported by your people initiative and your technology requests. And I think credibility comes into this as well. So it's important to have a sense of the cash flow situation of the organization. Uh, realistically, looking, looking at how the project is going to be funded, what will that actually do to the cash flow of the organization? Have those conversations, find out what the free cash position is. Modern SaaS solutions are much easier to deploy now because you pay effectively monthly. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's easier to get a piece of software in than it used to be, especially when it's cloud-based. But nonetheless, showing that you're attenuated to the cash flow position of the organization, and even if you're told there is no budget, being able to counter with, I appreciate there's no stated budget, but I'm able to provide you a case of how a small investment is going to yield a large impact and a big return, you can actually unlock budgets. Um, that way, but you have to go in informed and, and, and knowing how the organization makes its money and what the value chain is and, and how this project feeds into that. Okay. So, are they, Daniel, do you think they are there, are there key persuasive reasons or, or do you think that's what you've, you've summed up there? Is it, it's, you know, for building your business case for HR? Is, are there some key ones you pull out of there or just to highlight? This is going to sound like a slightly evasive answer. The, the key reasons that you need to put forwards are the ones that matter to the decision makers at its at its at its fundamental level um having having looked at a project having spoken to vendors and maybe starting with uh, a sense of what you're trying to achieve and then having the art of the possible shown where in a, you can see how an investment in technology not only solves this one particular problem but opens up huge opportunities going forwards You'll have built that narrative, uh, that appreciation and understanding, and be able to correlate that to what the business is is trying to achieve. The the real art form then is to take a pause and then look at what you're what you're saying and reposition each one of those elements into something that's meaningful and valuable to the people who are going to be making the decision and the people who are responsible for driving the business forwards. Because if they don't see the value they won't unlock the budget <clears throat> and it's not it's not just those stakeholders as well we, we we mentioned earlier that there's more and more people vying for budget there's other people who have projects that may not get off the ground because of the spend on your project so understanding what they're proposing maybe seeing how your project can help it, help with them if it's an IT project for example do they have a KPI around digital real estate and and could your project support what they're trying to achieve without having to go all the way down there and so and so the, the the stakeholder viewpoint really is the key to success and it will be different organization to organization um yeah no know, knowing what's important to your stakeholders is what will get the project off the ground yeah no, that makes sense so louis you know yeah from case studies tangible kind of you know experiences from have you seen anything from your clients with you know what have been the key reasons that they've got managed to get this right investment you know what what can you share with us yeah i think i completely agree with what daniel said you know just consulting widely uh before starting this exercise is really really important and as, as dan said you know understanding the priorities of other functions in the organization people systems impact everyone um uh, in the business um so commonly when we support organizations we consult with finance IT, customer service, operations, anyone um, directly uh, interlinked to, to outputs or even inputs into, into your HRIS. Um, those functions will equally want to be drawing on uh, optimizing their processes um, and the feeds in from your system of truth, your people system. Um, you know, they'll want to realize the tangible benefits that having that in place will, will equally bring them. So, you know, understanding their viewpoints will in turn round out your business case. 
you will have fostered some support from each of those functions towards that and it will you know it, it builds the story from beginning to end to show that you know it, it's not just the people function that the system will benefit ultimately it will drive efficiency business-wide um if we get the, the, the solution right so um i, I absolutely prescribe to consult widely um you know bring everyone on board with you uh, understand their priorities and build them into your well-rounded business case um, and tell the story from be beginning to end in how that will ultimately benefit um the bottom line and and so um, you may not have any but just to push is, is there anything is there any clear examples that you've seen that, that, that you know a key reason that this kind of turned that decision process in their favour. Is there anything or not? Again, you know, I share what what Dan said. It's 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 business centric, and again, it's centred in in your organisation strategy and where your senior C suite leadership team um, want to be and what their objectives are um, and priorities are. So, you know, the HRIS will go far beyond the, the immediate term and, and what we're facing into currently. So, you know, there's a longer term strategy and plan there, but, you know, looking at what's reacting right now and, and how that and how and that story needs to translate to, you know, what solves today's problems, but equally, how do you grow and, and develop it in the future as well? So back to what's the strategy, what's the data that supports the improvements that the, the HRIS will bring and how will that impact uh, company-wide into finance, IT, operations, management, employee experience, etc. Right. Okay. I, I mean, I really like, Daniel, what you said there about, you know, look at what else people are doing across the board. What can you piggyback on that? Can you help them? I, li I like that sort of uh, route as well. So um, a question, a question. Wonderful. Thank you for your question. So let me just share this with the panel. So how far do you think we need to do a full systems requirements before submitting a business case? So I don't know who would like to pick on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've actually got a, a, a perspective on this. Um, being uh, being employed initially by Sage to answer full business requirements and RFPs and, and tendering documents, you'd, you'd expect me to be a real advocate for the RFP process. In actual fact, I think there's you can go a very very long way without an RFP and coming back to understanding what your stakeholders value. And I think we, we can probably talk about that a bit more in due course, that how you, how you define value from a stakeholder perspective. But if you, can, if you can list out all of the criteria that your stakeholders have for this, well, actually personally for their, in, in their project and, and identify those that touch this project touches, you've basically got a list of buying criteria one of which will be price, another one will be um, something along the lines of uh, operational effectiveness, but you'll probably find you've got a dozen or more criteria from different perspectives that are important outcomes for this project. And of course, as an HR team, you're gonna have loads of outcomes and objectives, and they don't need to be founded in functional requirements in, in a full analysis. With that, set of prioritized buying criteria you've basically got a fantastic tool for evaluating vendors for evaluating who can deliver you the most value where where is your confidence in terms of their ability to realize that value and how does that map to how big these priorities are so you can get an awfully long way down a an evaluation process and understanding who can offer value to your organization without having to invest in a full RFP process. And the uh, organizations uh, like Silver Cloud, that, where Louise is, they are absolute experts at helping define what those buying criteria and priorities are. So I, it's my personally held view that the value, you get much more value from understanding the buying criteria than you do from evaluating through uh, an RFP. 
Thanks, Sonia. Louise? Yeah, I, I share that perspective as well. And, um, you know, as an organisation, as a HR leader, you're making a huge investment here. This is an important decision that's going to impact the organisation for a minimum of three years, if not longer. It's a relationship at the end of the day that you're entering into with that vendor. It's not transactional. It has to be right. So spending time up front investing in and really clearly understanding what your requirements are and, and what they are at a functional level level has its place um, to, to safeguard that decision making. But I equally agree with Daniel that think bring it up a level think about the scenarios what are the use cases what are your objectives um in purchasing the solution and and what are you trying to achieve um and use those as a, a suite of, of scenarios that you and the vendor can walk through together you know hr systems are not siloed um elements of functionality it needs to work as a holistic suite of tech from hire to retire and it needs to be completely frictionless to 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 serve you well. So coming at it from both angles, getting a little bit in the detail, but equally thinking about the bigger picture and what this needs to deliver for the business is a good balance to strike. So I, I would opt for the both, but, but keep it balanced. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Hopefully that's answered your question. Please, any more questions, please do send them through and we'll, we'll jump straight on them. Um, another poll then, final poll today. So let's get this one up and running. So uh, poll three is, what do you need to succeed this year? So uh, again, several answers here. So A is a bigger team. Is it increased upskilling in HR, investment in tech, increased wellbeing initiative to prevent burnout, better support from senior leaders. So you can have a go at the polls for us, please. That'd be great. Um, so again any thoughts while we're waiting uh daniel any thoughts on what might peak here yeah so I th business is a team sport so i would say that better support from senior leaders even if you've got amazing support already can only serve to everyone's advantage so i'd, I'd say better support from senior leaders would, would come out on top here um, I'd agree with that, and I'd also go with the increased wellbeing initiatives. Um, that is really at the forefront right now, and, and investing in how you um, how you build out your strategies around that, I think, is really important. Let's um, let's get some results up then, and and probably this is probably typical, probably because of the topic we're talking about today. But um, so yeah, the top one at the moment is investment in tech at fifty percent. Um, and then the other split, really, uh, which upskilling in HR, increased well-being initiatives, yeah, absolutely, and better support senior HR leaders, zero on the bigger team again. So it, it seems that kind of kind of makes sense in terms of the audience we have here today. I think so. Um, any any comments from you both there before we move on? Not not unsurprising, I don't think. No. Daniel. Yeah, yeah, quite the same. Um, so let's now look at, uh, we've talked about, Louise, if I come to you, we talked about sort of almost the why and we talked about the persu you know, persuasive reasoning needed. Um, but let's talk about who, who do you need to influence to get the right tech investment? How, how do you get that all important buy-in? Yeah. Um, and, and, and as we've previously said, I think, you know, Danny and I both agree um, the, the wider you consult, the better, um, you know, the, the IT will have uh, technology such as uh, help, te help desk functionality that just makes onboarding new joiners seamless. It also supports with um, ticketing and um, inquiry resolution. Um, they will equally have tech that will support you, or you may be fortunate enough to have a HRAS that has that functionality inbuilt. Nevertheless, there will be an integration equally into, you know, single sign-on and, and authenticating users in your system. So there's there's uh, synergy there equally with finance um, into your ledger um, and, and seamlessly integrating data payroll customer service um, but also considering and uh, consulting with your frontline managers and understanding what their challenges are through um, if you're fortunate enough today to have self-service in place what is working well and less well for them 
um, and, and the challenges that they may be uh, having and, and what is freeing up their time and the experiences that your um, that your employees have oftentimes overlooked as well are external parties so it's it's not a bad idea to consult with um, applicants and the experience that they've had so any recent new joiners into the organization always worthwhile having a chat with them and and comparing and contrasting the experience they had in employ um, in applying to your organization versus uh, elsewhere um, and why ultimately um, you know th they had a good experience coming through um, through uh, the routes that you have in place today so um, consult absolutely widely with everyone it will build out a really robust thorough case that tells the story of why this is important to the business and then use that information to play back to um to, to the organizational strategy and what will have an impact to those senior leadership teams when you're putting your case forward so the more groundwork you do up front um, the, the stronger the representation you have um, from the wider business towards your case even where they will have competing priorities um, and other compelling cases to be put forward and, and competing for those budgets but ultimately, in doing that, you will win support um, and have a really compelling case at the end of it. So um, oftentimes where we see business cases falling down is where this hasn't been done widely enough or it's only been hinted at. Um, you really need to get into the roots and weeds of this to really get an effective case off the ground. Okay, good advice, Tommy. There it is. And Daniel, again, you're creating these proposals and these you're getting these terrific, compelling arguments. So knowing who to get in front of is is absolutely critical. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that to Louise's points. It, certainly. Um, when when you are speaking to people, and it's it's all levels of stakeholder, like like Louise indicated, but let's say starting at the at the senior stakeholders the buyers and those who are impacted by or have a have a responsibility for an area that's going to be impacted by uh, your project it's really useful to be able to categorize what they value as being either personal value political value tactical value and strategic value um, the, the the personal value uh, is is when you spend time with them, you're asking questions and you realize that actually they're, they're impacted beyond just their job or they're, they're, they're having to do more work or make harder decisions or there is a, a real material personal impact, a pain if you will, that this individual is experiencing or individuals within their team. And that's really important to be able to address. Now it's difficult to, 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 to buy software on the basis of taking away one person's or a group's pain because that's not it's, it's difficult to empathize and be tangible with that and the, the art is turning that into something tangible but it's a really important piece to drive into your decision making as as your as you have a project that could influence and affect other people it's really important to be attenuated to that and it's valuable to speak to those individuals on those terms because it helps to get the buy-in um, is because they can see there's a personal pain that's going to be taken away. For, for, for yourselves, there's going to be personal pain that gets taken away by introducing HR technology as well. So you can, you can well sort of um, uh, align to that. The, the political value is something we touched on before. And I think what's so fascinating about here and now in times of uncertainty is the elevated importance of the political value. Uh, Louise, Louise gave some amazing examples there of how other departments may have technology that can help what you're doing in HR and, and vice versa and those touch points and connections. Um, but it's, it's, it is highly politically charged when you're looking at introducing new software and understanding what that will do uh, for other people and other people's budgets is really important. Um, then there's the tactical value that they're going to experience, which is really the ability to execute and the strategic value. Um, this would be where there's an alignment to some KPIs or some deliverables or a, or a higher strategic driver 
that they're able to share with you. Now, if you can identify and build off of those strategic drivers, then you instantly elevate the opportunity that your project is going to get attention and then buy in. And then it's the tactical, political and personal rationale that really helps to substantiate that business case and, and to give it the, the weight and the gravity and, uh, and the credibility that it needs. So that, that I would say would be <clears throat> once, you've, <clears throat> once you've been, as you're speaking to your stakeholders, really, really try to compartmentalize what you learn from them into one of those four value drivers. And that's gonna really help to orient <clears throat> your rationale for the, for, the, for the piece of work that you're doing. I mean, I like that. I like the way you can split that down across those, those different kind of key areas and how they all come together. That's, that's really strong arguments, I think, there. Um, and then let's talk finally, really, on ROI. Now, obviously, you know, getting getting kind of, you know, a return on investment that you can clearly show is, is, a, is a fantastic argument to have. So how do you put this at the heart of your business case? And, and I don't know if you can answer this one, Daniel, but, you know, what, what is the likely return from investing in, in a new HR system? And, you know, I guess just some, some guidance there or some numbers might be quite useful if you've got them. Sure. So uh, this is, again, highly uh, context dependent because you, you imagine the, the organisation that Lise, uh, Louise was speaking to earlier that has a desperate need for a rostering solution versus an organisation that has a small cohort who do project work uh, in professional services and need some kind of you know, rostering or, or time sheeting for that. The, the, the two use cases would vary wildly in terms of the ROI that's, that's delivered. Um, ROI is a fascinating area though and really leaning on um, specialists within your vendor or within the, at your consultant who you're using is going to serve you very, very well here because there's there's the tangible benefits, the tangible ROI, which really helps an FD to make the call. Yes, this is a wise use of company money. So that's where you do the sorts of things that Louise was talking to, the, the time in motion studies, identifying where time is being spent that could be repurposed, automated, smoothed, uh, improve the flow of business, the flow of operations, there's so many different areas and opportunities within an HR system to introduce those efficiencies that often you can create a justification for the investment purely off the basis of tangible outcomes and the material impact of the system uh, on the work that it's being brought in to uh, try and automate and, and smooth. But that isn't as far as you should go with your ROI case. Absolutely not, because the that's just one facet, and we've we've spoken a lot throughout this last hour, which has been brilliant, around the the more intangible benefits, the impact of the business, the uh, ability to achieve outcomes for the organisation by recognising the importance of the individuals and their morale, um, and 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 being able to then position that value back to the organisation versus what what does it cost to to access that value is is the heart of the ROI and is the heart of the business case as well. Um, I've just spotted we're really short on time. I'm just going to yeah, make absolutely. one last point on on the uh, when you're when you're calculating what the cost to you the business is, it's not just what you're spending in terms of fees uh, and and implementation costs. There's the there's the, the the cost of change as well and the cost to your teams for adopting new ways of working and going through that process too. So it has to be very rational and well balanced. Thanks, Daniel. I know we are, we are pushing it on time, but um, just briefly, Louise, for you then, again, perhaps we can, if you've got any, that go to these kind of case study areas, have you got anything there for us in terms of ROI proving with other clients? Um, I don't have any specific case studies, but there are a whole host online that, um, that, that that people can go and research. But just to build on what Daniel said, some of the less obvious elements of, of building this out and making the case, I would say, consider the cost of any legacy systems that you'll no longer be using. So what's the offset? Um, how will that benefit? 
um, and the intangible. So, you know, what will you do differently strategically to benefit the organization if you are no longer embedded in the, the transacting because your new solution is, is taking that forward for you? So, so what will you do differently? And finally, third point is another one that's overlooked. If you are really struggling um, to get your business case through, consider options such as land and expands. So, you know, land your core modules um, in, in your first financial year and then look to a wider, longer term business case of building it out. Um, that I, I guess all modules are, are pertinent, but the, the modules that you can short term live without um, and, and build on as time goes on, um, because it is a longer term investment. So that's another way of, of getting your case through might just take a, a little bit longer to get to the end game, but at least you're you're there and you're over the line. Thanks, Louise. Right, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. So um, listen, let's let's wrap it up there. But um, we hope we provide you some steps that you can take to enable you to build a business case for investment in these times of economic uncertainty. Um, and we hope that you know you can secure that budget to maximise your impact on the business through, let's face it, your big asset, your people. So thanks, my thanks to my panel today, Daniel and Louise, for your excellent insights and knowledge. So I really appreciate your time, and uh, equally to Sage for partnering with us. There is a recording of this um, webinar which we'll share with you all uh, afterwards once we've done a quick edit. Um, but thank you all for watching and taking part in the polls and um, we hope to see you in another webinar very soon. So thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Louise. And bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.